नमस्ते फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल माई सिंसियर अपॉलॉजीज फॉर मिसिंग आउट लास्ट टाइम माई रिग्रेट्स बट वेल आई एम ग्रेटफुल दैट यू नो वी गॉट एन अदर चांस टू शेयर थिंग्स ब्यूटिफुल थिंग्स सो ब्यूटी एज वी नो इज वन ऑफ द एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ द डिवाइन ए वेरी प्रोमिनेंट एस्पेक्ट एज वी नो इन द फोर फोल्ड द फोर ग्रेट गॉडसेस Shubhendu describes the mother of love beauty and harmony and we can see her everywhere you know we can see this wonderful universe and we can see it it is not the handiwork of just some casual random uh, play by chance the universe speaks of the beauty which is hidden within it and it's manifesting through forms and the other aspect of this beauty when we look at this universe is that uh it is not a static beauty because we understand by beauty something static but it's something dynamic it's pulsating with love it's it gives delight so love delight harmony they are all uh, different aspects of beauty so we can see it all over in the universe in the cosmic functioning uh, even what we call as times accidents eventually are like the divine artist who is for a moment effacing certain lines only so that more beautiful lines can emerge so the whole universe is a, is is an evidence that there is so much beauty uh, within the heart of the eternal but then there was a phase in ancient times of course beauty was regarded as divine and as shubhendu says beauty is his footprint showing us where he has passed especially in uh, great civilizations the greeks valued beauty a lot then of course uh, um in egypt and yes in india though in india the emphasis was lot more on the inner beauty whereas in greek we see the emphasis was on outer beauty but the two are simply complementing each other and as the mother reminds us one of the uh, work of the asura in india was to uh, make us uh, believe that beauty is something to be shunned Uh, it it began to be regarded as a snare because we didn't really understand beauty and since beauty uh, we started shunning beauty then beauty is a very um, if i may say so a shy goddess she steps back she this is not like kali will assert herself so she steps back and then the world is filled with all that is um, uh, ugly all that is sordid all that is crude all that is repulsive so uh, this is an age a new age when we must once again bring out this aspect of beauty in all its fullness so especially with the coming of mayavad this idea of illusionism uh, beauty was the first aspect of the divine which took a hit because uh, beauty is normally associated with forms and if all forms are an illusion if life is an illusion then it doesn't matter you know whether we have it nice neat beautiful orderly harmonious or whatever way it is all that is required is to find the one divine within and that divine of again was uh, regarded as one who is impersonal a permanent an indefinable purusha or an indefinable someone or something and therefore we fell from that great uh, days of glory when we looked at uh, the soul creation and the creator as one single continuum wherein creation was a means to manifest the creator and the creator being beautiful all beautiful sham sundar therefore creation had to be beautiful and this creation included not just the material creation but all that we create by way of ideas poetry language literature arts crafts music dance even science everything had to be beautiful because um, we draw from that beauty which is held within us so that's why we see in indian thought at one point of time in the in the great days of indian civilization that there was so much emphasis on uh, things like speech in gesture in posture all the dance forms when we see uh, of course this beauty this ideal of beauty has now been distorted by the um, asuric uh, nature which we see all the great truths have been distorted truth has been distorted to mean simply outward facts which creates its own problem 
and uh, similarly we see that strength has been distorted into simply the power to bully individually and collectively uh, violence which is actually weakness not a strength and um, love has been distorted distorted to mean lust uh, joy or ananda has been distorted to mean simply a momentary pleasure and beauty too has been distorted to means something which has been more like a external uh, cover up what is called as a make up not a very good word to make up for something which is missing so we see that all these terms beautiful aspects attributes of the divine have been distorted and we must bring them out once again in the fullness uh, in the world play so what a, what really is beauty so we start with beauty starts with the beauty of forms and forms as i said uh, we can start with the physical form so there is a whole tapasya of beauty and this tapasya involves building a form it's not just that one is born beautiful just because the looks are good now looks are good is a very very subjective thing uh, it has its own objective criteria but again uh, but the beauty of form implies a body that is supple strong harmonious in proportion well balanced and everything within it its movements are very rhythmic there is a very beautiful line in savitri where shubindu describes the mother's walk and he speaks of it as in a mystic temple dance so even the gait the gesture the posture there is a whole science behind it so we didn't speak about manners and outer behavior why because manners and outer behavior can be deceptive it's very easy for people to learn to give a fake smile or a fake smile whatever we want to put it and to easily try to impress uh, to sell a product but it's very difficult to uh, you know but but the person is caught the moment how i see for instance one of the things how is the person walking what are the gestures uh, what is the way he is sitting now these are the things which you cannot easily fake and and the smile is it simply a smile of the face or is it the smile from the eyes is it a smile from the heart so there is a whole world to be understood here but the first thing that the mother advises is uh, in the tapasya of beauty is uh, to build a form which is harmonious which is beautiful which is strong and supple both these aspect so sometime there is an emphasis on strength but it's at the cost of suppleness also we must get rid of the idea idea that beauty is fragile this is a very modern invention but uh, when we look look at uh, durga durga is regarded as beautiful and strong so this is the idea we must bring forth that beauty is not uh, fragile beauty is strong one need not be tender one need not be chui mui and you know um, easy to break uh, to be beautiful Uh, beautiful is strong because strength is also an aspect of the divine and they must work together uh, so this is uh, when we look at the tapasya of beauty with regard to the form several things come into play for instance uh, work rest exercise food all of them should be in balance right balance a, a day's routine one of the things that the mother advises is that for the body what works best is a discipline so the discipline should not be very rigid that uh, i must do it at this time regardless of anything and everything but at the same time it's good to form a habit it helps the body because the whole body system tends to be tuned at that point of time for instance very good if you fix a time for meals it's very helpful because then all the juices all the secretion digestion is at its maximum uh, then of course she says that everything in balance and because harmony balance order they all go together so things should be in a state of balance when we eat food it's not excess either in terms of uh, um, you know the quantity or in terms of um, preferring one thing uh, too much over others so there should be a kind of uh, you know preferences especially pleasures are just a contradiction to beauty so the law of beauty demands an exactness and thoroughness similarly with she says about exercise and again every day a simple uh, exercise like walking 
is something so beautiful but at the same time in everyday life beauty can be brought in uh, the mother speaks about climbing up and down the stairs it can be a very conscious act and at one point when uh, the mother asks your window i see that the uh, legs and the figure of indian women is very beautiful uh, how how did how does it happen and shobinda said because they were uh, used to carrying pictures on their head in old times and taking a walk you know with the pictures some of us may still remember so now of course um, because um, uh, one of the effects of the not just ai but we have robots to clean the house everything not realizing that these simple acts were very good to maintain health and keep us beautiful now of course when we do these acts in compulsion it's a different thing altogether um for example as the mother gives an example of the uh, iron smith when he um, you know exercises his muscle it's not the same thing as when we do conscious exercises uh, with an idea to infuse consciousness in the cells so uh, the more we start withdrawing from these physical activities because life is made to live in a cocoon uh, the more we need to restore to other means to build a beautiful form and well whatever it is life has moved forward it is what it is but very often uh, these extra comforts also bring into the body and the vital uh, a kind of seeking for pleasure a kind of inability to prefer even our sensations get so blunted uh, that we are unable to really bear impact of certain you know things so this entire thing is a package and then of course rest is so important because it starts showing up on the face uh, it's so true and in rest it's very important that it's not just the quantity of sleep quantity is important but more important is quality so there there are a number of things like uh, just before going to sleep it's not a good idea to watch tv or especially you know um, uh, excited debates on channels or to get into heated animated discussions so in that sense it's always good if you have your own little space to sleep the sleeping together is never a very good idea for various reasons so this way one can sleep into a beautiful sleep quiet sleep maybe with a cup of milk or or a fruit juice and slowly with some music going on but even if that ideal state is not possible always so at least one can contemplate about the divine contemplate about something beautiful uh, offer the whole day that has passed so that the traces that are going to uh, you know create all kinds of lines on our face and forehead are ironed out so iron them out before sleeping this is one thing which uh, is a general advice that people give to married couple sort out your problems before you go to sleep so if you had a fight don't sleep with an unresolved fight so but always it may not be possible first of all it's never good to fight and quarrel fight and quarrel are a direct violation of the divine presence within us but still uh, if that has happened so at least one person the person who is pursuing a higher life he should avoid getting caught into that net into that play of world of forces and later on he should quieten himself and try to offer all these things to the divine before really entering that state of rejuvenating rest so these are some of the simple tips and i am sure uh, all of us are aware of that and then to link everything to the divine whether it be food exercise rest another thing which the mother speaks of is uh, austerity in work which is part of the tapasya of beauty so there are people who tend to overwork and uh, they feel very good about it and it's all right work tends to uh, pull us out of a egoistic state in which sometimes we may be caught but at the same time when we take upon our body more than what it can the nerves tend to get fatigued so this is something which she advises she says you must have nerves of steel but at the same time do not demand from the body what uh, more than what it can you know output because then the body starts being driven by the vital especially when we are driven by some kind of ambition and uh, or by certain mental ideas about uh, about life about things then it tends to over a period of time it uh, the nerves become weak fragile 
and they they begin to tell upon the human body because nervous system has so much to do upon our uh, physical form even the face it tends to tell upon the face so one of the tips about um, looking good beautiful is to to learn how to really rest and restore ourselves in a nice harmonious beautiful way and for that it's always good to create the outer atmosphere which is very nice very mild the colors the shades all this is a package uh, the music we play in uh, all these things the people we associate with all these is part of the package of beauty of form but as we said beauty of form is only one aspect what about beauty of all our expression our our actions so each action should be beautiful so anything we can do and for this there are number of exercises i mean exercise i mean in everyday life i remember when uh, champaklal ji once uh, uh, he he recounts that he you know he pulled the chair and the mother literally uh, almost scolded him and he realized that this is a very crude way of doing something so he learned to pick up the chair and keep it now even in that in gestures and postures in dance we discover it each mudra and these mudras have an effect upon us so a thing like picking up a glass of water and handing it over so i have seen you know there are people who will just pick up water and keep it like a, with a thud as if neither the water is willing nor you know <laughs> so a simple act of handing over the water simple act of putting food in in the thali these are small little gestures so you know now of course all this is gone you have a buffet and you just uh, pick up but i do uh, feel that all these things which are ingrained in the fabric of indian society which has now been lost were so beautiful when you know someone came and um, thali mein khana parosna so it was not just about food being put in the thali but that gesture that smile that that expression that you know why don't you take a little more <laughs> all this is part of that whole package and and even if we cannot go back to that life uh, or maybe we can but at least in every everyday gesture when we are communicating with people uh, often i observe that when people are very angry their gestures begin to change their speech begins to change and speech begins to become more and more uh, crude see the more angry we are we become short of breath and we our uh, speech become very loud it, it the tone increases and then the words they come out as machine gun fires uh, the only difference is that machine gun will probably kill you once for all but words will kill you a thousand times <laughs> and <laughs> make you suffer so much more so uh, we should be so careful about how we speak and now this is not a uh, art you know it's not like something one has to learn artificially so there is a very beautiful letter of shri bindo uh, which so beautifully summarizes it for example we speak about speak the truth but say it pleasantly satyam vada priyam vada so say it beautifully but then you know it can't be done artificially and sometimes it can become only simply pleasant speech and the shruti uh, cautions us that don't just speak things which are pleasant for the sake of pleasantness uh, it should not be like a false thing spoken pleasantly so both must be there truth and pleasantness so it's very difficult to keep and somehow we have grown up in this uh, strange notion that truth is very bare truth is very rough truth is very crude people often ask can you hear the truth well the mother says to this supreme harmony and delight in fact my in my own little experience i have seen that wherever truth in the real sense is said not just truth of appearance but truth in the true sense is expressed in its all uh, roundedness in its completeness it brings an immense peace and harmony instantly and even the mother goes on to say it cures truth has the power to cure but it's not truth which is seen only on the surface you did this to me and you did that to me and you said this and you said that that's not truth that's simply an appearance so we must know that truth is a roundedness so along with what is spoken the motive behind the inner state inside and whether it's a continuous process whether it's characterological whether it's simply a momentary outburst so all this is a totality of truth and deep behind the truth of the soul which is always beautiful so when we look at life like that then expressions become automatically good 
for example if somebody is angry and uh, um, if i start vibrating to that anger what happens uh, invariably the speech becomes crude it's a violation of the law of beauty but if i don't uh, vibrate to that anger if i allow it to settle down and if i cannot at that point of time just to remain quiet or still better if i can see that behind all this anger and anguish there is the beautiful soul inside then my expression will change so this this is not something mechanically to be learned from outside but it's something we should flow spontaneously so it's not a sharbat like ru afza which you mix with some uh, sugar and all this and serve it but it is a real ru afza that is that by that i mean um, the sukoon and thandak of the soul the the sweetness of the soul must come out in speech must come out in acts must come out in words must come out in every gesture and posture so this is the this is different from manners this is different from learned artificial automated behavior it's different from becoming a expressionless mannequin it's all about something which is living and dynamic and pulsating from within so this is about uh, our outer life then of course um, a beauty of outer life which is not accompanied equally by a beauty of inner life is a very dangerous thing you know and sometimes it can be very crude and vulgar you know it's like putting a, a crown of <laughs> gold <laughs> i mean pigs are very cute but on a pig's head this how the the story goes you know it it a pig without the crown of uh, gold is beautiful you can you know really admire it but the moment you put a crown of gold on a pig or uh, you know in a political scenario on a donkey it looks very strange it it only multiplies the ugliness otherwise one just simply accepts the way nature has made someone so this is uh, one aspect and equally sometimes we go by appearances for instance socrates as we know he was uh, very ugly from the standards of uh, outer beauty but he was a beautiful being inside so it's so important to get past these appearances and start looking at the inner being our own not others because <laughs> that's given to us so beauty of thoughts so what are beautiful thoughts these are thoughts which create harmony and joy so invariably as i said beauty is accompanied with joy beauty is accompanied by love beauty is accompanied by harmony they are a package so the true action of beauty is it creates a aha feeling just like when you see a material universe when you see something uh, you know built constructed with with the eye on beauty what does it do to us it gives a joy we fall in love with it and it's something very harmonious so it's so important that beauty of thought must express in a harmonious way in a you know and again sweetness is another attribute which which comes with it and and it brings joy both within us and joy to the recipient that's the beauty of great art work of great art work of literature poetry which is um, you know which is beautiful now this beautiful poetry at once uplifts us and fills the heart with joy so this is its action so all of them go together so so thoughts that are kind thoughts that are full of compassion thoughts that are generous thoughts that widen us all these thoughts uh, build a beautiful inner being so this is the second ideal of beauty one is the mundane ideal which is about outward but as i said in indian civilization the stress was on the inner uh, not that the two are opposed to each other we are now living in a age of synthesis and the two must run into each other flow into each other but yes the inner first and the outer must flow from the inner so building the inner being similarly an ethical nature by its nature becomes beautiful because it it wants to do something which is right but again in indian thought right and wrong was not about moral conventions not about a religious and social doctrine but it was dharma which is something very flexible one of the things that the mother speaks about it when she speaks about beauty and beautiful expression she says that you know to really engage in work and action which is beautiful we must rise above the moral and social conventions 
So one of the examples that uh, comes to our mind is, well, there are people who can't understand Arjun and the Mahabharata. Because they find it, uh, all violence is bad. This is a moral convention. But violence becomes violence, hinsa, when the inner state is of devouring someone, of destroying someone, of killing someone, of murdering someone. Then that violence stems from weakness. But there is a kind of outer expression of strength manifesting in even warfare, which stems from the inner state where there is no hinsa. And that's why, of course, in ancient times, we had this code of conduct of the Kshatriya, where, you know, you, you had certain do's and don'ts, uh, which Indian Army, I must proudly say, even till today, to a large extent, it follows. I am personally aware of this, that uh, on the uh, now Kashmir is much better, but uh, there was a time when terrorists would freely walk in, and, and I know of one particular instance where uh, they had killed a jawan and slaughtered into pieces and uh, sent it to the unit in, in a bag. And the unit people were so angry, they wanted to go and go on a rampage. And they were stopped by the commanding officer that they are what they are, but we are not that. So while they took the revenge, a justified uh, justice was rendered, but not in a crude way. So this is something which we would discover that, you know, what happened in Kargil war. So in Kargil war, we know that um, most of these people were uh, either regulars or mercenaries who had come from across the border. But nobody came to claim those bodies and Indian soldiers gave them a fitting funeral according to the rituals of the particular religion to which they belong. Now all these things are so beautiful, they inspire us that even though there is war, so it's not war which is ugly. It's the state of consciousness. Whereas on the other hand, one may not engage in war. So I am touching upon this moral notion. Gandhiji didn't engage in war. But he became the cause of so many things like Noah Khali massacre and other things. So it's not about war or not engaging in war and these moral notions and social notions. Buddha leaving his family is a beautiful act. Because through that one act, it, it must have pained him. He brought a new light to the world. So, um, the, this idea of action which is beyond moral and social and religious conventions, which is yet beautiful, not by any outer standards and yardsticks. And look at Ram, uh, you know, when we, we, we don't understand some of his actions, but, but he stays with what is truth, what is dharma. So, this whole idea that we have to discover the law of beauty inside and this law is as universal as dharma itself. So, when we begin to be governed by this law, then thoughts automatically get aligned in that direction. For instance, even towards a person whom we don't like, who may have hated us, done lot of, tried to do lot of harm, never one should allow a, a wrong thought, a thought of ill will to be released towards this person. Why? For a simple reason, first of all, those who harbor ill will and those who have thoughts which are um, thoughts which are harmful thoughts. So whom do they harm first? To the one who is, who is releasing them. You have released these thoughts towards someone but you are the hub. So snake may bite somebody and kill someone but look at a snake's life full of fear, full of that poison which he holds inside. So, uh, and it's a whole inner world which is swarming with things which is so terrible behind a seemingly beautifully beautiful face. So, um, that of course is uh, the art of deception which human beings have perfected, unfortunately. <laughs> but, but thought should be beautiful, even towards somebody. And that's what we see in, in again in the great epics, Mahabharata and the Ramayana. When Ravan falls, then one of the things that Ram tells Lakshman, go and learn Raj Dharma from him. And he says, but he was your enemy. He said, no. <laughs> he had taken Janki and now with, with his coming out of the way, that is gone. He never was an enemy. He never treated him like an enemy. What a great ideal, you know. That's why I feel books like Ramayana, Mahabharata, must, they, are, they are a must for those rooted in Indian culture. That's how we will understand what Dharma is. Such subtle things. Even after the Korvas die, how to treat the dead body even in a war? Uh, it's not supposed to be just, you know, uh, strewn, quartered, thrown aside, disrespected. 
whatever the enmity was it's gone now it's like it's it's any body which had held the soul within so there is no limit to which these good thoughts can go and they do a lot of good in the world we speak about doing mother's work but we do so much harm with bad will every bad will is a direct assault on the divine and a violation of the law of beauty and when there is a violation of the law of beauty there is lack of joy one of the ways we can understand whether we are living according to the law of beauty is no, or not is by the joy or unhappiness that we feel inside so this is one part of joy then similarly with feeling so beautifully the mother speaks of a love which wants to possess love which becomes dark ugly full of possessiveness full, full of jealousy it is love without a doubt about it turning into hatred but it is it really a beautiful love this is what we normally call love and it needed a great poet <laughs> with his beautiful psychic touch to say i cannot give you what men call love so you know because he knew that this is not love so in the domain of <laughs> feelings to cultivate beauty and for that one has to be so vigilant every time we look at you know a dark feeling coming in trying to steal in like those small little uh, black cats <laughs> or <laughs> or whatever i mean creeping <laughs> creepy things we have to observe it and remove it it's not good for us forget about others at least for self respect you know this idea of nobility and dignity was so wonderful in the aryan civilization you are in aryan you can't think like this you can't feel like this to feel like this is very low and ugly if at all there is a justification of pride it is this 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 sense of nobility i can't stoop to this level to feel this way to think this way and then of course in will is a domain which has been completely distorted anything and everything under the name of uh, ambition desire seeking after pleasure so pleasure and beauty don't go together seeking after pleasure meaning thereby we are going to distort our inner being because pleasure by its very nature is ephemeral every time we run after pleasure then what happens after the pleasure is gone the instant kick is gone we go again sometimes to the same shop for the same uh, rasmalai and jalebi and rasgulla <laughs> sometimes to the wine shop sometimes uh, of course rarely to the divine shop that's wonderful if we can do that but often we run after it because what is the problem of pleasure it's not about ethical things or moral things very simply it creates craving see that is the beauty of pleasure touches the very surfaces of life maybe some superficial nerves it titillates them and that is where we see again acts like sexual act of course they can be done with a lot of beauty where there is love where there is true togetherness the deepest union ultimately expressing itself in in the joining of two physical beings but most often or not it becomes an act of pleasure for carnal desire and what happens then there is a craving and when there is a craving there is unhappiness there is a seeking again and seeking again and then there is addiction this is what we see today that uh, by the hook of pleasure the whole society has been uh, wired almost uh, hard wired which is very unfortunate so uh, a seeker after beauty must shun pleasure he is a perfectionist because beauty is not something which is instant gratification you see how mums used to make in their kitchen and how food is made in in a typical hotel so it caters to your quick palate and so it's quick because we also are in a hurry so we just say khana kitne der mein aa raha hai you know how much time and 10 minutes sir 15 minutes is all the same masala ready and he tosses it and gives it when mothers were making there was a preparation this its beauty is one with perfection again without perfection eye of perfection there is no beauty when we want to build beautiful things maybe a poetry maybe a a work of a sculpture maybe a an epic maybe even um, you know enter deep into the world of science forms and what's behind it one has to be so patient it cannot be done in a hurry so these are small little things i mean one thing which i learned when i had joined uh, one of the departments in the ashram 
so I'm not going to repeat the old story, but a new story. The old story was about, I was taught how to open the door <laughs> and, and how to keep the vase. But, but I also said, I know how to arrange flowers. And he said, okay, very good. So I said, I want to arrange flowers. I was very excited about arranging flowers. <laughs> so the lady money man said, okay. So I took the flowers and I just put them. I thought it's very nice. <laughs> she said, this is not the way to arrange flowers. So I learned about arranging flowers. So from there, I had a great revelation. That beauty is also about order. See, between harmony and beauty, there is something called as order. And this order is, you see how people arrange in Ikabana. There is, this, there is an order, but this order is something which is uh, very different from how we would conceive it. And that's an order where things uh, don't become static. So every Ikabana flower arrangement they keep a scissor that maybe somebody can make it even more perfect. So disorder, chaos, ugliness are uh, hallmarks that the Asura has passed this way. Wherever he goes, it devastates. Whereas beauty, order, perfection, harmony are the footprints of the divine. So this order again is not a rigid order. That I am going to keep this particular thing on my table in this way. And it cannot be disturbed. No, because things will change. As things change, this is an evolving order. The beauty of perfection is that it's ever evolving. And with that we come to the most difficult aspect of beauty and that is harmony. We cannot conceive of beauty without harmony. Now the problem of harmony is, well, that happiness aspect of beauty, beauty of thought, beauty of feelings, all this can come inside within a person. But harmony by its very nature involves different elements. Here again, beauty of uh, the harmony of thoughts and feelings and body is possible. But how do we create beauty in human relationship? Because it's not just one person. It's two persons, three persons, many persons. And it's a very challenging task. And I have a few tips over it. <laughs> Not that I can give a perfect recipe or formula. But see, one is that this rigidity and narrowness creates a problem in life. So when a new element enters into a life, be it a child, be it a wife or husband or a child or 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 others in our life, in, in the ashram context, other inmates who enter. With each such person, there is a little bit of shift that is going to take place. Now, people who want to remain stuck and rigid in a certain fixed way, they cannot harmonize. And this is a lesson one learns in olden times when one travelled in the general compartment or even in the reserved compartment of Indian railways. Now, I am sure things are different. So what used to happen? You have a berth which you have paid for. And when the time comes for you to sleep and there is a person inwardly feeling, why he has come? He is unreserved, this, that, all these thoughts are going on. I mean, it's okay. And then quietly you will sit on a little bit of your berth. Now what happens? The person who's, who believes that he has paid the money, he begins to push. <laughs> and <laughs> this other person is also a deed. He begins to push your leg or ignore. Now what kind of a tussle is going on? It's a very funny sight. I used to be very amused. Why are you doing all this? Okay, just you know, give a little space. It's okay, you know. To make a little space. If he's my brother, what will I do? Will I just kick him away that you didn't get a compartment? So this wideness is required at every level. We cannot build harmony in a narrow consciousness, small consciousness. And wideness implies that everybody not just adjusts, but is willing to accept. Adjustment is not a very good word because adjustment means, oh, I have to adjust. Atiti, tum kab jaoge? No, that's not the thing. But to learn to accept, to adapt, it is very challenging. And the third thing which comes, which I feel is uh, what is missing, that's why we cannot harmonize whether in family life and collective life is because we have not understood the law of sacrifice. This egoistic life which wants everything for itself, 
it cannot harmonize even in a relationship it wants even when you say that you don't have expectations still there are expectation but the joy of giving the joy of sacrifice for the not because sacrifice is not martyrdom but sacrifice because well you are refining yourself as an act of nobility you know often uh, uh, when we were growing up it was something which was told to us ki uh, when people used to fight somewhere in the surroundings you know because always there are people who fight <laughs> it's a common pastime of humanity now also but now they fight inside the doors maybe because houses are like that you can't hear all that they want is nobody should hear that you are fighting <laughs> sometime they will put the tv on a loud so now the only difference was that we were taught as children we were growing up see this is what the sense sometimes not it's not a good thing but uh, elitist in the true sense that well you are a noble person was when people were fighting on the street uh, it was told to us that you know this is not what this is sign of smallness shudrata ka lakshan hai this something got stuck in my head uh, in my growing up years that well uh, to fight to quarrel is something very demeaning degrading to myself mother even goes on to say that you know these quarrels especially when we use words which are very ugly very uh, abusive it's like spiritual suicide i have seen people almost you know completely wailing their soul because you know they have indulged in this kind of thing so it's a whole package um, as i said how many the law of sacrifice the law of tyaga renunciation acceptance looking upon everybody as a brethren you know this idea of fraternity which is so central to all religious teachings at their core but it fails why because it is built on doctrines fraternity can only be built if we uh, build it on the sense of the self the one self so we have unity equality freedom and fraternity the four wheels of the chariot of jagannath and they can only be built when we have jagannath in the center so when we have the lord who is in all creatures in the center then we can automatically unity comes naturally not by any artificial means but because all of us are integers of a cosmic whole and each of us must do our part something which physiology teaches us that you know each thing in its right place rit 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 the cosmic order each thing in its right place even the social order in ancient times was based on that thought knowledge intelligence is the apex sight vision inspiration faculty of hearing walk the ability to express all that one receives as knowledge from above is the apex of humanity not based on outer wealth or mercedes car or or a position that one occupies similarly strength courage the bhuja of the kshatriya the power to protect the weak and stand up for what is true and beautiful and right that was the next and then we had these are all activities in all of us but we must learn to create this hierarchy within us to harmonize our life or the vaishya imp- impulse to circulate all of ourselves into the world in a large generous act but also to receive from the world with both hands beautifully to create new things to produce and of course the shudra impulse wherein to serve all mankind to become very willingly and happily the servitors of all now in our life we must harmonize these elements but always we must know that core is love and the apex is that uh, higher intelligence if we take that away if we just keep serving without these things in our neither love in the heart nor Uh, the higher knowledge or wisdom in the head then it will become a meaningless thing or if we keep going on expressing our strength but again without love in the heart and wisdom in the head then it becomes a cause of disorder so there is a kind of hierarchy cosmic hierarchy which we must discover within ourselves social order will now is going to change each one has to discover all the four aspects within oneself so all this inner harmony and of course outer harmony by discovering the one self within 
to recreate unity, rebuild unity even where there are differences because unity is not uniformity but unity is about the many-sided expression of the infinite. Unity by its nature is that which uh, can take in as much diversity as possible. And there is no other country as the best example always than India. You know, the way we have handled diversity, it's amazing. So unity in diversity, not just multiplicity. Multiplicity is again a misnomer. Uniformity is obviously a non-starter. Similarly, along with unity, the sense of fraternity, also freedom. Now, this freedom is each of us is given a certain function by again the, in the cosmic order. We must fulfill it beautifully and not tangadaw in everybody's life and their function. That's their problem. <laughs> each one must do their, their bit harmoniously and beautifully. So, very often when in a family life, in a relationship, when people are all the time pointing, you must do this and the person, you must do this. Are apna apna dekho. <laughs> what you have to do, do it well. That's it, it will give you joy and happiness and spread that around. But rather than pointing out and noticing why you did this, why you wore this dress, why you were like this, why you were speaking this. Are so in that sense, freedom. Freedom is the third limb. So unity, freedom and of course fraternity. Fraternity can never be built. It's the only term which has never been built till date. People have tried to create unity. They have tried to, you know, talk about liberty. But uh, fraternity, equality, one can try to build equality. But fraternity can only be built when there is this sense of the oneself in everything. So ultimately to manifest beauty and harmony, one has to awaken to the deepest spiritual self in us, call it the soul and of course the higher spiritual being and and yes, finally uh, go through the whole process of the transformational yoga because the natural members of our being, uh, not only the body but everything else is not able to express the divine law and the divine truth. So only through a process of progressive transformation and in the end, uh, how is it, how, how to really uh, shape our inner being at least and turn it into something beautiful. So here comes the role of a uh, education starting from conception. Because it cannot be done when a, when a child has picked up all the vulgar habits, grown into an adult. Then we start, you know, trying to teach him and train him. It doesn't work out like that. So we had all these things inbuilt, Garbhadhan, Sanskar. So when the child is in the womb, beautiful thoughts and feelings the mother must have. She should be surrounded by beautiful things. The family life, the atmosphere should be beautiful. And if two people can't live without fighting, okay, fine, stay away from each other. Maybe if necessary, separate, but don't create hell uh, for yourself and for everyone. Uh, of course, if there is compassion, it, it takes care, but still... So, uh, this, this sense of beauty and harmony must come from uh, childhood, even in the conception and later on, through the education, these are habits which must be inculcated. As I said, through examples. And one of the best ways of examples is to uh, read that literature which we have lost. Uh, we have uh, declared that Ramayana is a myth and we don't teach it, but we are quite cool with Harry Potter. We are fine with all those lokas and avilokas being described there. Why? Because it's a story. Well, story, human mind doesn't differentiate between myth and reality. That's the beauty of these tales. They knew that it will have an impact on the human mind. Doesn't matter, you sit in Harvard and declare that it's a myth. Its impact will be there. And the entire civilization is there to justify it. Whereas you may say that Harry Potter is not saying it's a true story, so it can go, it's a work of fiction. Still when you read it, it will have an impact. Mind does not differentiate between the virtual and the real. Because for the mind, everything is virtual at one level and everything is real at another level. So these beautiful stories which uh, at least I was fortunate enough, uh, Mother's Grace and my parents that I grew up with, plenty of them. Uh, and the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, it's so much missing. Why? Because secular education. Ramayana and Mahabharata are secular books. So many examples of the great heroes and warriors, till date, uh, they are my ideals. Uh, never a film star or a, 
uh, or a you know a whatever star they call it uh, dust star they could ever uh, capture my imagination because it was already with arjun and bhishma and drama <laughs> so these stories must be there with children and the example of those around them and then when we grow up a little more when the time for stories is over let us write stories so often with children this exercise should be given write a beautiful story which is from beginning till end all beautiful the mother writes one of them is a, i mean those who want to take an example a sapphire tale it's beautiful from the beginning till end there is no villain there there is no fight to capture and you know no prithviraj chauhan coming in okay these are tales of valor wonderful but it's a story which is just beautiful from beginning to end it's like radha and krishna a story which is beautiful from beginning to end very paradoxically radha never marries krishna but she is all all krishna full of krishna krishna never marries radha but krishna's love for radha is something which is beyond anything one can even imagine so it's a beautiful story so to learn to write and imagine beautiful things is part of the school part of the cinema the entire society must change towards that and then of course still further to be in the company of beautiful things and this company is not just uh, outer environment which of course should be harmonious and beautiful without a doubt but one of the best companions are beautiful books satsang satsang doesn't really need a group of people to come together because very often after the satsang they indulge in all kinds of inanities acha aapke bacche ka kya ho raha hai aaj kal wo kahan hai you know all those foolish things chole bhature kal bahut acche the are thodi der to after the satsang keep quiet for some time go home you can call up and anyways you are going to waste each other's time for one hour discussing all these things but books are a beautiful companion but yes the choice of books beautiful books teach children to choose make beautiful choices beautiful books so one of the simplest ways to fill the mind with beautiful thoughts to flood the heart with beautiful feelings is simply to read books like prayers and meditations savitri shobindo's writings the mother's writing automatically because when we read it swami vivekananda he can inspire a man who is about to die buddha fills you with noble thoughts literally after reading him you feel how small kind of life human beings lead so to be in the company of these books rather than all the trash even so called petrified scholarly wisdom is something so nice and then of course the company it's so important if we in the name of wideness keep the company of people who are degraded and degrading it is going to influence us we let's not uh, start imagining we are sandalwood tree chandan vishvapat nahi lipte rahat bhujang well if one is fine or like shiva we can take halal there are some people like that yes those who are given this mission who can be unaffected will be like the big banyan tree but most of us are little saplings little bit plants which are trying to grow up and we should be very very careful of the company we keep that's why the mother was never in favor of all these marriages and marriage parties functions and what does it matter divine is everywhere all life is yoga and all kinds of things i have heard justifying these things well behind it is nothing but the urge to you know just party let's accept that at least be honest but what happens we bring that atmosphere i have seen this myself that there are people not now but well at one point of time that how company affects you with children with grown ups with children because they are sponges and of course with grown ups so it's so important in the name of a wide liberal life you should be very careful and as a corollary i may say that let us keep company of the noble the wise the beautiful people even if they are few in being even if we cannot physically meet together let our thoughts reach out to the great masters and if they are physically present to communicate with them this opens a channel through which beauty grows in human nature so this way the the value of company and finally above all that beyond all the books beyond all the great human beings is this divine presence which is the source of all beauty all love all joy all wisdom all strength because as i said beauty must be strong it must be rooted in truth 
love must be strong beautiful but rooted in truth truth must be the base that's why the super mind otherwise it will not it will become fragile after some time it will come down so let us find that divine presence that integral divine presence and draw all our nourishment and sustenance from there and that is the ultimate secret of a beautiful life a life in contact with the all beautiful contemplating the all beautiful not those gory ideas of the divine because even they have been polluted god takes revenge god punishes god sends his wrath good lord god must be turning he cannot go to grave <laughs> but he must be turning mera bhi kya kar diya inhone vindictive god if you don't worship him he will punish you for good what kind of horrors we have created in the name of god so let us be done with all these kind of uh, religions frankly but to turn and seek the god who is in the temple of the heart and there to find him and to love him to him all our passions and feelings to turn to him and then life will become not just beautiful but divinely beautiful okay thank you so much and if <laughs> uh, there is something i'll be very happy to share thank you sir thank you so much for an interesting enlightening and beautiful session uh, i'm sure participants have some queries or comments yes manan please unmute yourself uh, thank you uh, namaste alokda namaste I have two manan questions yeah i have two questions and they are in the context of uh, integrate education and practice mm -hmm. working with school children mm -hmm. uh, the first question is uh, what is at the source of spontaneity of expression uh, can it be said it is a combination of dynamism and sincerity mm -hmm. and the second question is what is the relation and interplay between spontaneity and the evolving will of the nervous system yes okay good it's about spontaneity and it's two aspects so uh, there is a the most common spontaneity is a vital spontaneity and we need to understand that uh, everything that is spontaneous it may be sincere seen from a certain surface point of view let's say for example i get angry and i hurt someone it's spontaneous and it's sincere because i am angry and therefore i am expressing anger but that's not education that's a life which is more or less like an animals are very spontaneous i mean uh in that sense they are driven by instinct but only thing is they are driven by instinct of self preservation or with hunger but our spontaneity vital spontaneity is to be overpassed man becomes truly man when his reason can really uh control these animal instincts to master them he must become uh, the the animal must become a vehicle and not a uh, uh, you know like garuda and vahana and not the other way round so spontaneity of a vital kind is certainly not a very healthy thing and children have to learn through a, a rational discerning spirit of self discipline that well not everything that comes to your heart to your will to your impulses have to be expressed you have to learn to discern make a choice between what is beautiful and what is not beautiful what is true and what is not true what is driven by the impulse of anger and what is driven by a genuine authentic feeling of love so this is one part which must be part of the integral education and uh, as the mother says and it's very evident that man becomes man when he exercises reason to exercise a certain control now there therein comes the role of moral education which has its own great role but this is not the end because as you rightly uh, i think uh, it's understood that mind can after some time mind starts controlling the whole thing artificially so that's when the problem of sincerity comes in because we learn that you know we learn the art of deception because the mind says okay if you unbridled way express your things then there is a problem so in a typical company setting you are angry but you don't express anger because if you express anger openly it doesn't work but from behind you are doing the undercutting or as one of my friends once said that 
Ati bhakti chor vritti. So if you are trying to please someone too much, there is a thief inside. Now, I don't agree to that because, you know, you uh, turn away the chef and the wheat both together. The people who can genuinely love. But the point is that the mind has learnt behaviors which are going to impress others. So one begins to show off, one begins to even be very pleasing. Are aapko dekhi badi prasannata hui. Now, obviously it's falsehood. And but... <laughs> How badi mahan hai. So, you know, it, it's to buy. So, that is ugly. So, that's where, you know, uh, it's insincere and a crass insincerity because it's combined with the, the will behind is to deceive, to impress, to make a show. So, beyond it, one has to enter into the intuitive spontaneity, which is the spontaneity of the God-like nature. When Bhim says that, well, Gandhari, Mata, if there were 200 children, I would have killed all of them. Now, this is not the uh, animal-like angry spontaneity. It's the spontaneity of a god, of a cosmic dimension. It's like Vayuputra speaking. That, well, if you had 200, I won't stand adharma. This is my nature to root out all that is adharma. I don't care. You will cry and dash these tears and one day you will grow and evolve through all this. So, uh, from the animal spontaneity, the mind must intervene. Uh, and... Uh, you know, disciplining through reason is important. But we have to climb beyond moral and reason to arrive at the true spontaneity, which is the spontaneity of the divine. He slays without stint and is full of compassion. But it's a journey and it's a process. So that's where the evolution comes in. So for a child, uh, he must learn because a child doesn't have a developed reason. Let's say five-year-old, six-year-old. You can't start sitting and giving him a lecture on morality. So there he must learn that, you know, even when he has a spontaneous urge, there are this spontaneous urge can be expressed in a beautiful way. The spontaneous urge can be expressed in a very uh, disharmonious and a very crude way. So just to shape and chisel, that's all. And then as he grows up, as I said, through stories, to bring in that element of, a, a, you know, as reason develops, then the child must learn what is truly self-control. So this is the next element. And then when he goes beyond, if he is ready, not everybody is ready to go beyond reason. Uh, so we must not prematurely drive people uh, <laughs> through the heaven but path towards a precipitous fall. But there are those in whom the urge to go beyond reason has come because they realize the frames and the limitations. That's where the awakening of intuition by quietening the being. So that spontaneity can only come when the mind is freed from preferences and opinions and the vital is freed from restlessness and the sting of desire. So only when the vital and the mind have become quiet, then that divine spontaneity, intuition can emerge. So we have to teach children how to go through these phases at different points of time. One of the simplest things that they can learn is how to become quiet. Now it's not easy in a classroom setting because children by nature are mainly vital, uh, they are based, rooted in the vital. So to train the vital while the mind is not yet developed is a very challenging task. And that's why the role of physical education, it's so important because, you know, all these energies get directed and in physical education, by its very nature, the mind has to come in, games and sports, you have to come in, you have to bring in the team spirit, you have to bring some kind of a control over your physical body, your nerves and everything. So, a, a, a discerning physical education, that's why one of the things in the ashram, uh, I'm sure must be there in the, in the Delhi uh, MIS also. A lot of emphasis on physical education of children right from young age so that they can learn to express their vital spontaneity in ways that are beautiful. I mean, if you play a game, your movements have to become harmonious. Uh, you have to develop team spirit. You have to learn to take failure and uh, jo victory in the in its stride. So all these things are part of that package. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, anyone else from the audience? If they have a question, please raise the hand, or you can put up the question in the chat box. Uh, If not, then we can, of course, go to Dr. Bhajlani, sir, if he has any comments. Sir. sir, please. As usual, I look, the stock was full of many gems. And uh, I don't think I could pick up all of them. But uh, just to mention a few. 
uh, to the beautiful uh, sort of a way he uh, talked about the common expression of makeup makeup as if uh, we are making up for something missing uh, missing in fact if we are missing something it is the inherent beauty for which we try to make up with the makeup but then it just struck me that another term which is also sometimes used in that is makeover makeover may not be so bad makeover could be sort of a modern term for transformation it's a sort of a transformation that we are talking about maybe uh, it's not uh, as uh, sort of sober as uh, transformation but it could mean something similar and uh, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, the spontaneity and the sincerity uh, of expression uh, which cannot be put on and has to be there uh, just had one small question if uh, uh, although when we run out of time still i feel like asking uh, the question is you know uh, uh, i look the you mentioned in passing that uh, uh, if the point comes where uh, the person people can't live together and their life uh, is a hell then they should uh, separate yes but then i find in many situations the couple knows that their life can't be beautiful and yet they go on living for the sake of uh, the society for the sake of norms for the sake of the alternative which may not be pleasant for the sake of family pressure not only they go on living although they are living parallel lives they're not really sharing anything with one another they're living under the same roof yes. and uh, uh, although they are trying uh, to be indifferent but yet their life is not really beautiful for them uh, then there are people who have couples who are split living separately for some time once again societal pressure and parental pressure brings them together and in worse sometimes uh, they are not even married but uh, they are forced to marry a partner whom they know uh, right from the beginning there are red flags but again because of parental pressure or societal pressure they feel that somehow it's essential to get married and therefore they do mm. now in these situations uh, uh, of course there can be no one blanket answer but uh, would you think that uh, it is uh, that would they should not assume that life cannot be beautiful with that partner and learn to see the divine in the partner no matter what uh, the partner is like or to put it in more common terms if life serves you lemons make lemonade out of it or should they be have the courage to do what they think is, uh, is something that will make life beautiful for both of them truly because beyond a point uh, the so called adjustment is not possible so what would be your sort of uh, in such situations yes uh, very true bidlani ji and one of the i think uh, deciding factor is children because uh, if if a child is there then Uh, i think uh, there is a certain degree of centering around the child so most people at least in the indian setting i am aware of that they like to be together because you know child is the uh, common center the second aspect where they can come together or find a togetherness is if there are common goals and ideals so you know if there is a common aspiration then that can uh, you know hold them together and yet allow them space if especially if the aspiration is very uh, high and wide uh, but one thing is common which i feel which is needed i feel in today's time is to allow for lot of space so one of the things that i recommend of course if they cannot be together as i said there are no hard and fixed answers and uh, it's not a question of only courage but because it is becoming a perpetual pain and hell you know and we are not here to create hell for whatever reason it's not about being right or wrong and who is right that's an endless story but simply because they are not able to live together in a harmonious peaceful way and Uh, now they have got into a groove and there are many reasons why it happens habit and baggage and many things can come in so we don't go into that but yes if if life has become a misery and a hell yes they should separate but at the same time there is a uh, via media option which i see many couples nowadays are evolving uh, it's it's out of necessity and it is to that they are there for the social uh, for the sake of society because we are still going through a transition uh, they are together but in their own house in their life they have complete freedom from each other now how they use their freedom is of course another question but they are free where it's a very conscious decision i know a few people 
they even live in separate rooms which is i think is important um, and uh, they follow their own life routine uh, not just the career they have their own friends own goals uh, but well uh, they don't want to you know because it's very painful for the parents for the child especially if they have a child and and of course it's very our society though it's becoming much more accepting it's not so easy so this via media is what people work today and if that doesn't work that most of the time it works actually if if that doesn't work and especially if there is nothing like a child who will be traumatized and then it's definitely better to separate seeing the divine in all things yes should be an effort for those who are practicing yoga and that's something which should be done in the very beginning uh, one should do it but then it's not enough that you see the divine in the other person the other person may still be miserable by your mere presence <laughs> i mean to put it like that that you know we, we the, recently there was this controversy on saint tukaram and his relation with his wife socrates socrates was abandoned by his wife i mean his wife and children they didn't care less for him he's such a beautiful being <laughs> so well that's one aspect of it that you must see the divine but there is a point where you cannot force yourself if the other person is not happy and you may see the divine in the person but the other person sees the devil in you well it's better to keep the person away from the perceived devil so then yes uh, for everything there is a red line which you know nature will eventually create that yes and it becomes even contrary to sadhana because sadhana cannot be ultimately centered only around one person it cannot be only to see the divine in one person one has to learn to see the divine in all it's a universal wide movement so at some point possibly one has to uh, you know take a call and pr- and my own feeling is that in today's time this living together in a very close contact uh, turns out to be a close combat <laughs> and perhaps it's not favored by nature nature is wanting to give more space to help us grow this is what my my feeling is and to live in the larger sense of universality and yet when two such beings with a common aspiration common idea come together like you know what mother has described um, about two being centered around the common aspiration common goal then it is beautiful but though even there when the lower elements come in it makes life very ugly two people who are centered around the great ideal same aspiration yet because the lower vital and physical nature is what it is and the surface life is what it is because the ego is still there so it it makes life very difficult so i suppose staying with a distance maybe separate rooms if possible different houses is uh, i would recommend for those who are sincerely seeking a spiritual life except those ab jinka ho gaya ho gaya ab usko kuch nahi kar sakte <laughs> lekin for the new aspirants and the new entrants even if they live together just to try to give space spiritual life is largely an individual pursuit yet yes thank yes. you that was very enlightening based on your vast experience thank you hope to have you soon again thank you so much yes yes Thank you so much sir. Thank you.